Okay. And um, so Rachel is our featured speaker. She recently won the Mandy Aftel Award for Handmade Perfumes. She's also the Sustainable Perfumer of the Year. She um, has a background from Tahiti. She'll explain that when she comes on. And um, what I find the most interesting, and of course it makes so much sense, but when she talks about Tahitian vanilla, um, the, the thing that really like gave me the light bulb, and of course, maybe many of you already know this, but of course there's no such thing as French vanilla every, because it doesn't grow in France. Every, that means all the vanillas is really colonized. And so that's really the premise of how this conversation got started. And um, I can't wait to hear more about her, her story and what she's doing. She's very involved in um, sustainable movement and so without further ado, this is Rachel Binder. I need me there. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much, by the way, for um, joining me today in this conversation. I think uh, the first thing I would like to do is just make a statement of gratitude for this wonderful little piece of land that I make my art on and I live with my daughter um, and, you know, um, was taken and I want to give gratitude to the Keech, the nation, um, often known as the Tongva, but uh, that has really caretaken this land for so long. And so I just would like to make a statement of gratitude and then um, also just acknowledge, since we are going to have this conversation, not just the 118 different islands that make up Tahiti and certainly Reatea. Um, that lives in my heart, uh, but you know, I would, since we're having this conversation, like to acknowledge all of the different um, island nations that were occupied mostly by France um, that bring us to this conversation today. Um, <clears throat> I, I guess first, uh, after that, I will say that uh, when I had been a sommelier, uh, you know, previous lives that we've all lived. I had been a sommelier, but also I was a theater actor who spent a lot of time doing sensory work um, <clears throat> in the tradition of Lee Strasberg with the actor's studio, which is very conscious smelling, um, a way of consciously smelling, and that really influenced me. But also in coming to things in uh, perfume, which were always the interest for me was uh, the plants, the flowers, the resins, and those stories. I thought, I can't begin to do this without some kind of acknowledgement uh, for the journey that these ingredients have taken. Um, not just the journey that one ingredient I might use has taken to come to me, whether I've grown it in the garden or you know, purchased it from somewhere else, but you know how much history um, and often deep colonialism each of these ingredients had. I just thought there's got to be a true way that I can go forward with this. And I had been raised with stories about Queen Pomari IV, in particular, who was um, the last queen of Tahiti. Um, Pomari V did rule after her, but she was the last queen of Tahiti. Um, she was called things like the eyeball eater and um, you know, she was negotiating with uh, settlers, with colonizers while breastfeeding. Um, really, she kind of has her, her own incredible story. But I thought, what a wonderful way to acknowledge the stolen flowers and the stolen land um, by acknowledging this one thing about Queen Pomare, who, of course, I grew up with stories about uh, my my. And I will acknowledge, I have not encountered, by the way, the racism inherent that maybe my grandfather or my mother experienced. So I would like to acknowledge some privilege as I move forward in this conversation. Um, but these stories, these oral stories that have been passed down were everything. And how I make my perfume is very much wanting to reflect these family, these ancestral stories that are so important to me. They're you know, my art, but when you look at so many uh, different traditions where oral history is important, um, it becomes another thing. It becomes another thing that really shouldn't be silenced and should be celebrated. And so that's definitely something that I try to do with my, with my work. Um, but since we are going to begin this conversation on Tahitian vanilla, um, and as Yosh was pointing out, you know, of course, France doesn't grow vanilla 
but it were the it was the stolen land that France was occupying predominantly that um, had vanilla on it. But vanilla didn't even start on one of those islands. Um, vanilla, of course, is from Mexico, um, potentially also Guatemala. And um, after the discovery, I mean, I use the joking word quotes because, of course, um, Europeans didn't discover vanilla. Vanilla was existing and thriving uh, wonderfully in Mexico. And um, there are a lot of traditions around that, right? So vanilla was not discovered. It was, um, it is a Mexican plant and part of Mexican traditions. And uh, once this, you know, beauty of vanilla was passed on, there was this huge demand for vanilla and they were trying to grow at all of these different places. It, it first came to Tahiti, for example, in 1700, but the vanilla beans wouldn't grow. They wouldn't grow. Nobody could figure out how to make the vanilla beans grow. And um, it wasn't until there was this young man, a horticulturist, horticulturalist, um, who was also enslaved. And it's important that I say his first name to you now because he didn't have a second name. Because if you were enslaved in Reunion at the time or um, the island in the Indian Ocean near Madagascar, you weren't allowed to have a last name, right? So, Ed, excuse me, Edmund. Um, so that was the name he was given upon being enslaved, taken from Africa and brought to this island, Edmund. And he had this natural sort of gift with plants. And uh, he kind of figured out this little mystery of how to pollinate these, you know, orchids, these vanilla orchids. Um, which was sort of tricky because there's kind of a flap on them, right? Um, and even to this day, uh, vanilla is often hand pollinated. It's something that's like a bamboo shoot and you just kind of go in like this. But nobody could figure it out everywhere. Everyone was trying to figure it out. And when he went to the man who was his, um, the slave owner, right? This, this man who kept him in servitude um, and showed him that the vanilla beans were in fact growing. He at first didn't even believe that this, you know, young man um, displaced from Africa had figured it, this thing out on how to make vanilla happen someplace other than Mexico. And so he said, you know, do it for me again. And he not only did it for him again, he taught everybody on that island how to pollinate vanilla. And it was really a big deal and enormous news. And um, what's kind of, interesting. Uh, usually this is where our story would have actually been turned off by colonialism because there was in fact a man in Europe who was a, a botanist at the time who claimed that he, he had figured out how to do it and taught them how to do it on that island. There were enough people who not only recognized that Edmund was the one that had taught them, but recalled that visit, that they actually stood up for Edmund and said, no, this man did not come up with it. You know, Edmund did. He, he is the person to credit um, with the fact that we can do this. Um, and it wasn't until, I don't know, let me look at the, um, 1848, excuse me, 1848 that France outlawed slavery um, in those islands. Um, and I'd like to say that after uh, Edmund was liberated that he lived this wonderful, like happy, joyous life. Um, that of course was not the case. Uh, he served some time in, in jail um, and he, but he died in, you know, in poverty. Um, but the one thing he was given uh, before he passed away at a certain point in his life was the last name Albus. So Edmund Albus, uh, which means white for the whiteness of the vanilla orchid. Um, so, you know, kind of incredible that uh, somebody at 12 years old figured this out, really kind of amazing and, and moving. Um, but he's the reason that we have this wonderful material that is in our, our food and our, our perfume and is now part of Tahitian culture um, and Madagascar culture and still, of course, Mexican culture. So, I mean, that is just sort of an amazing thing to kind of acknowledge. And I had certainly um, never even heard of him until I looked into this. Um, now, Tahitian vanilla um, is actually a blend of two different vanilla beans that sort of like um, naturally occurred uh, in Guatemala. And it has a very unique smell. And um, 
I don't know uh, any of you, if you've ever like blind smelled different vanilla beans right next to each other, but I recommend it if you've never done this. It's a really wonderful way to experience how the different expressions of what is just an incredible, incredible material um, and how the temperature, the land, the soil and the practices around that can totally alter what those aromatics are. Um, so for Tahiti, um, which has its own um, type of bean, which they often call vanilla Tahitianus or whatever. Um, so it can be confusing to even see if you're sourcing a Tahitian vanilla bean or a vanilla bean that's just named after that particular bean that is known so commonly in Tahiti um, because it does taste different, you know? Um, but what is also unique about uh, Tahitian vanilla and then just vanilla in general is, um, and I love stories like this, nothing gets me more excited than practices that take this amount of caretaking and love that you know vanilla really does. So vanilla is like a, an orchid in a vine and it really uh, has to be closely monitored um, for everything um, from like pests um, to just even the most basic temperamental things that can possibly happen. The orchid itself only blooms for four to six hours, four to six hours, and it has to be pollinated in that time for there to be um, vanilla beans, which is kind of magical. Like if you think about it, like just it's kind of magical. Um, and then when they are ready, uh, they then have to be laid out. I mean, at least in Tahiti, very often they are laid out on um, like this metal slab initially to bake in the sun, you know, and then they're rolled um, and stored for another portion of the day. And then the next day you kind of started all over again. So it's incredibly labor um, intensive, but it just creates what I think is a very just special and, you know, beautiful, beautiful aroma. Um, but when we do look at, you know, raw materials and I like vanilla that have, you know, such a crazy history that, you know, um, every, every part of, of this story um, of vanilla is, you know, has the fingerprints of colonialism on it. And that's true for so many materials. So, when looking at them, it's not just, you know, it's important to acknowledge this history, you know, acknowledge uh, the wonderful uh, young man who at 12 years old, 12 years old and enslaved, you know, uh, helped bring t vanilla to the entire world. Um, but it's also important to look at how people are being compensated and how the environment is being treated for these ingredients and for these materials. You know, of course, the, the classic hallmark of colonialism is the exploitive, um, exploiting, uh, you know, perhaps another workforce for cheaper labor and bringing things back to the more colonial nation. Um, often that, you know, nation can even be the United States right now, right? Um, for that, you know, cheaper labor, and then also not caretaking the earth in the manner um, that perhaps the native tradition would have respected the land. So um, I'm going to use a, an example since we're talking about diaspora. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with uh, a company called Diaspora Spice Co. I find them just so inspiring. Um, so this young woman um, who's originally from India and lived in the Bay Area started a spice company uh, that she wanted to decolonize spice, at least for India. She wanted to offer things that weren't sitting on the shelf that were really like the high quality of beautiful ingredients that she was used to um, that she would get at home when she was in India. And then she wanted to make sure she was caretaking the earth. So she was using regenerative farming practices. Um, so she's caretaking uh, the soil and then the community with that. So um, I've been tremendously inspired by her, but part of how she got started was she realized that fair trade often wasn't enough. And she went to um, this one farmer who was making this incredibly beautiful spice and said, how much do you need you for you and your, um, your family to really thrive 
for the next two generations, what would we have to pay you on an annual basis so that you can, you know, caretake this bit of earth and continue to bring beautiful, beautiful materials to us? Um, and she found out how much that was and she fundraised it. And so she's just been, um, she is a tremendous inspiration. And also, um, if you're a fan of cooking and spices, definitely um, check that company out. Again, it's Diaspora Spice Co., uh, really kind of amazing. But that for perfume is, you know, if we look at that from a perfumery perspective, it's really living the dream. Um, you know, for me, I feel, um, you know, I'm a much more handmade artisan natural perfumer who only works with whole ingredients. So I, you know, extract a lot of my own, of my own things. Um, but I also like to know that I'm within one person of knowing the actual name of the person who distilled it or, and or farmed it, um, which has been for me quite a challenge. Um, what's happened with this, you know, colonial industrial revolution on making things so easily mass produced or mass producible is um, we take these materials and they now no longer have a face, they have a cast number. So it's sort of almost implying that not only is every jasmine the same, which of course every jasmine is uh, wildly different uh, molecularly and otherwise, depending on where it's grown and what type of jasmine it is. So, so we're looking at everything like it's, it's you know cookie cutter, but we're very divorced from this conversation of what people are being paid and what um, those farming practices are, um, depending, you know, depending on where it is from, um, uh, which can be very, very challenging. And I know as perfumers, we all have to, you know, make our own decisions um, in terms of how we source. But, you know, I, you know, I always say to people that there are like a few key questions um, that most chefs I know ask, and when I worked as a sommelier in the wine industry, I always asked, what are your farming practices? In other words, do you spray and are you caretaking of the soil? What are your labor practices? Um, you know, are people, can you, can you give me an honest answer about, you know, how people are being paid? And then how is this being extracted? You know, what really is the extraction process? Um, because sometimes that can be, I think, a little unclear. Um, to use a, an example that steps us a little bit out of the perfume world, um, I'll say that I was giving, um, I was giving this talk on organic and natural wine and um, all of these different words, right? sustainable, regenerative, you know, what are they, to a group of people in the wine industry a number of years ago. And it was, it was a lot of fun because at the time I had a, a natural wine list. Um, and so I was coming from that place and they had given me this gift. It was a coffee table book and I didn't open it until last week. And I think this helps convey how sometimes troubling uh, the words around um, some of these environmental things are. And the book was celebrating nine winemakers for their sustainable farming practices. But when I opened the book, those particular nine companies were in fact, are large culprits for um, spraying the Napa and Sonoma, Napa Valley and Sonoma, um, and in fact had winemaking practices that were not fantastic for the soil, um, for, you know, and for everybody else involved. And also, um, I can't totally tell you what their labor practices were, right? So I thought, what a, what a fantastic example about how unfortunately some of these phrases have been um, taken away. Um, and, you know, it's hard, right? I don't, I don't know about you guys. Um, sourcing things is a, is a very hard part it can be a very challenging part of perfumery unless you just buy from some of the um, major big guys. But I think, I think if more people start just honing in on those four questions, um, I think we can move, I think we can move the needle. I think we can move the needle. And when we look at farming and I say farming practices and I say regenerative, um, I'm, I'm definitely referring to um, first of all, the soil and to me, the soil is the answer for everything because as we've seen in wine, 
You cannot, you cannot make a beautiful wine without beautiful soil. Um, but also for our approach to global warming, we really need to take that carbon and put it back in the soil from the air. So growing plants uh, with the correct farming is, is a step in the fight against global warming. Um, but it's about making sure those practices caretake the soil. Interestingly enough, um, this major, and I'm usually, a, you know, I love my, my grower champagne, it's true, it's a weakness, um, which is funny because I grew up from people and in a place that nobody had ever tried champagne. Uh, but uh, this one champagne company, which is, you know, kind of larger, I think Rotary Air uh, is their name. Um, they approached this, you know, really well-known um, champagne maker to turn their entire operation biodynamic because they started to understand they weren't going to get the quality of the wine unless they changed their, uh, their farming practices. And it just became, it's just so evident. And so it's been nice to see that in that industry, there's even though there's still greenwashing and using the wrong words, there's some acknowledgement that what happens in the field, that there's a, you know, that there is an entire important thing that happens, the, the, the whole journey of a grape to the point that it gets to wine or is sitting in a cellar is a significant story. And so I just, I hope for perfume, we can understand that whether it is an aroma molecule made in a factory and you aren't sure, um, what the legitimate status is of their runoff, or if it's you know a, a flower essential oil that you purchased from somewhere, each of these ingredients has a story that's really important. And I think that story even can continue in your perfume bottle, or if you make body products, your body lotion, but it's all part of an important story that I think should be more of our journey as perfumers, really understanding that. And for factories that exist far away from, um, that may say that they have saintly practices. Uh, I'll just say this, um, you know, I look at other industries and what has gone on and that is mostly where we can learn because, you know, we, unless we are in one of the other nations that a lot of these factories are in that are developing some of these, aroma chemicals and some of them are in the United States. I know there's um, a lawsuit going on in Florida uh, against aroma facility. Um, but unless we're in that place to look at it, it is very hard to know because probably the people running the company are doing the best that they can and what they say, what they're saying to you, they believe to be true. It is hard to know unless you are there with the environmental reports. So it just, it becomes like, you know, you almost for a second thinking of that can feel helpless, but I really, really believe that if we continue to ask the questions about this stuff, like where was this made? Like, I don't see where this was made. Like what, I see who that it's got this label, but what country was this made? And there are like little red flags that can help you know, I think um, in terms of like safety um, or morally, um, but you know, some, some of this, we are gonna be flying into the unknown, but I will for factories just use um, an easy example, which is what's happening in, in tequila and Oaxaca right now. There's a big boom of, isn't it cool? Um, tequila is now cool, right? Mezcal is now cool. And so you have um, a lot of white owned uh, American companies coming into Mexico and then into Oaxaca. They're buying out the agave at um, really, they're driving down the prices um, and they're buying them younger, um, which, is, which is problematic for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of what they're then making is a little bit more like, um, it's like vodka and then you add aroma chemicals and then you call it tequila a little bit. Um, but what's the problem is, is it's really negatively impacting the waterways. Um, in tequila and in Oaxaca. Um, and so it's, you know, I always say maybe don't buy American owned tequila, right? Because that's a clear delineation of colonialism, right? Like there are Mexican owned companies 
that are doing this. And in fact, it's in a Mexican organization that sponsored something that I think is really inspiring, um, particularly since we were just talking about poll pollinating things and, and uh, vanilla and uh, they're, they're have something it's called the bat project and it's a project that goes to preserving and protecting um, the bats and bees and pollinators um, within mexico to protect these plants um, oaxaca for example is one of in terms of plant life one of the most biodiverse places on the planet so it is really an important thing to protect so you know with tequila and oaxaca i can say Yes, please, you know, please buy Mexican owned, like we're taking out the middleman um, and we're giving that money um, as directly to Mexico as possible. Um, what I've seen in the bar industry is people starting to ask the hard questions, like what does your humidor get paid? I've actually seen a bartender say, what does your humidor get paid? Like, what is their pay rate before I'll buy, I buy this from you? So you've seen a lot of this pressure start to shift the industry and start to force companies to, you know, publish this type of information, which has really shifted things in a beautiful way. It hasn't, you know, fixed things. I think there's still some Instagram star who just launched their own tequila line, right? There'll always be this kind of thing happening. But if we can start to understand that those little things that are happening today, not yesterday, today are part of this overall colonial view. You know, I really, God, I came hard against this when I have a perfume called Rasa. Now, I named it Rasa because that was something I had studied for, you know, 20 years as part of my yoga practice. Uh, but I didn't make the story only about Rasa within Ayurveda, right? Or Rasa within India. I included that concept and the perfume itself to more of a global experience. Um, for a number of reasons. But, but the first one is because that wasn't my story to tell. The other one, I could tell the story that I had studied Rasa for 20 years in yoga. I can tell the story of land because I've studied land and I've studied plants, but I can't tell the story of someone else's history, someone else's relationship with Ayurveda as it was passed down from generations, I can't do that, right? But what I can do when I was so inspired to name the perfume that is I can make sure that um, I'm sourcing things in a way that respects that word and makes me worthy of being able to use it. And so with Rasa, when I um, rebatch, because every vintage for me is, is different because I like to celebrate the differences of plant life and years. Uh, but what I did was I, and this was not easy, um, everything other than the passion fruit itself, including the vanilla, was sourced in India, carefully, painstakingly, difficult, very, very, in a very difficult way, um, sourced in India. Some of it each time, you know, I'm told like, this is all, this is, there's only this much. I'm like, that's okay. Um, but I wanted to show the respect that I had for the honor to use that name, but also I, as an artist, like to explore land, botany, and you know, all of the things that maybe made me interested in wine. I think, I think land has an energetic imprint, right? Beyond just that this is limestone and chalk, or this has this type of diurnal shift. I feel like there's, there's a feeling that, that land has a feeling. And so I like to make things that reflect as much as I can the heartbeat of that land. That's what I try to do. Um, we can't fully get into uh, appropriation and everything that we're going to cover here. Um, I think if you're on this call, you know, you've probably witnessed a lot of it over, over the last year and it becomes challenging on ways to explain to people what appropriation is, but um, I think simply, if it is your story to tell, your personal story to tell, you still you tell your personal story. You know, um, it isn't my personal story to tell another nation's story. I can tell the stories about my grandfather. I can tell the stories that are Tahitian that were passed down to me or that my cousins told me, right? But I can't tell the stories um, of the Aguala Lakota nation. That's not my story to tell. And so I wouldn't name a perfume, for example, Smudge, 
because simply that is not my tradition. And so I hope there are different ways we can encourage people to feel a little more comfortable around this conversation of appropriation, but it is a, a part of um, this larger colonial uh, viewpoint. Um, and in particular, not to go too far on this, um, when we look at Mexico and vanilla, why are there not like 75 perfumes about the fact that plumeria and vanilla are from Mexico? It is very interesting that we choose to glorify some cultures that they're sexy, right? Like, you know, going to Hawaii is sexy, right? But there, are, there aren't a bunch of perfumes about, wow, this is from Mexico. That's so cool. So um, not only is appropriation, but the way we either sexualize, fetishize, or otherwise look at a culture as like, less sexy or cool. This is also part of that bigger colonial prism. Um, you know, we, as Yosh has been working so beautifully and hard um, on the scent wheel, you know, I hope that 10 years from now, we've gone beyond the court, this conversation of the O word, and we look at a scent wheel that represents the world, not just everything that's not European can go into one category. Right, um, and how exciting that is because the more people become aware um, of other cultures, the more aromatics that are available to them, the more, oh my God, the world is a magical place is available to them. So hopefully uh, we can go uh, in, that, in that direction. And then another thing um, I will say on, back to you know raw materials and whole ingredients, um, for me coming from, again, the, the culinary and the wine world, this idea that something has like, this is just a jasmine and that at all times you weren't totally clear, every process of this story was kind of nuts to me um, because that's not how um, any of the <laughs> chefs that yelled at me, <laughs> there's a little of that that goes on in that culture too, right? A culinary culture, um, you know, would always want me to be aware of those things. But now I'm very, very grateful because that is part of where I take my joy. But that is also where we're going to call out these practices that are still um, can be so exploitive. And India, of course, you know, really being a lot of the heart of, of this for me, even though it's happening everywhere. As I sat in my perfume studio this week, NPR had a story on and they said, the center of the world perfumery, grass, France. And I nearly fell out of my chair. I thought, are you kidding me? Like nobody in France came up with how to make an attar, right? Like, you know what I mean? Like that, that, that did not come from there. And so um, it's interesting that this one Eurocentric story has been told over and over again. I mean, literally every year at the same time, there's a story about them working the fields in Provence and picking the jasmine. And so this portion of what we find beautiful is also where the colonialism lies. It should be just as beautiful that there are these amazing guitar makers in Canouche doing these just amazing things and clay pots and fire. I mean, that, that keeps me up at night. Like that is my like heart and soul, right? Like we need to tell those stories too, right? We need to celebrate those stories. Or if it's a country like uh, we don't know as much about, you know, maybe this is a chance to just learn a little something because also how boring that we're only looking at perfume as eau de toilette, eau de parfum. You know, I never really made perfume like that. Um, so it can be done. Just walk away and it doesn't have to be only this European formulation for making perfume, um, which how liberating is that creatively? So liberating. Um, and we can learn from other cultures, right? Without taking it and calling our own, right? We can go, oh my God, what an amazing tradition that I learned from. That's fantastic. I'm basing some of my creativity on what somebody like thousands of years ago in Canouge started to do, or who knows where else. So this focus on what we find sexy in perfume um, is also part of it. And so I hope as we start to you know, untangle some of this, we'll look at ingredients, 
and in ingredient combinations that maybe we weren't paying attention to before. You know, um, us all having the same perfume wheel, but the way that perfume wheel is going to change probably over the next 20 years is, is just incredible. And so when I think of that scent future of us embracing a more global world um, instead of a Eurocentric bubble, like that is wildly um, exciting. Like that is where people can also, this can be a way to help, you know, shift people, um, which I think is really incredible. Um, and the last thing I'll say, you know, I noticed there were some other uh, people talking about plants and energy um, earlier before I did my introduction. And I would say that um, also, it's interesting that using phrases like uh, plant medicine uh, and you know, uh, calling to my ancestors, uh, plant energy uh, or how a plant vibrates are all things that when I have spoken them have been dramatically and, and almost violently responded to as invalid ways of making perfume. And that way I'm making perfume does happen to not be a Eurocentric viewpoint on perfume, but it is mine. And we need to respect other artists' ability to make their perfume and whatever their practice is. For me, the land has energy, plants have energy. That's why I make whole ingredient perfume because it's, it's, it's medicine for my soul when I make it and I'm sharing it with other people. But there are so many different ways um, artists can make perfume and part of decolonizing scent, I think is really embracing that and learning. And isn't it wonderful that there will always be something more to learn? Um, but yes, anyway, uh, you know, in closing, you guys, I'm sure there's questions, but you know, those, those key questions asking our suppliers, we may not be able to shift everything tomorrow, but you know, certainly, um, a way to respect a country like India that's given us so much globally uh, to perfumers, a way to respect them is making sure if you buy something from India, whether it is a molecule or a plant, you know what people are being paid. Um, for those of you who don't know, the last year, the suicide rate of farmers has been just devastating. And so this is how we can pay respect to uh, peoples that have given us such, such incredible scent traditions. We can show respect by finding ways in whatever small ways we can to ask the right questions. And then hopefully the people that do use larger suppliers, you'll be able to move their needle. So they know that they won't be able to just use the cheap labor and get away with it anymore, that people are really calling for you know, a shift in how we handle things. And if it changes the price of things, that's just fine. But the people that need to be paid are, you know, the farmers and those doing the hard work. So anyway, thank you everybody for, you know, I'm sure listening to, um, to all of this. I could, as Yosh will tell you, go on and on and on about soil types and diurnal shifts and um, all of the wonderful uh, microbiology in our soil that gets me really excited. Um, but, you know, I appreciate uh, people showing up for this because, uh, I'm sure for a lot of us who um, have been on a decolonizing path, sometimes we feel like screaming in the closet and going, oh my God, I'm losing my mind. It can be very isolating, um, you know, and then, and hard to have those difficult conversations or just to find the language when somebody so innocently looks at you and says, why is that not okay? Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, we all need each other in these times to, to help untangle all of this and help people feel disarmed so they can be open to, to hearing this. Um, Rachel, that it's been so amazing to listen to you. And there's so many um, thoughts that went through my mind. I want to open it up to questions, but I also, could you tell us a little bit about the Kiss the Soil Foundation? That it's you the ground. Worked? Oh yes, please, oh, thank you. please everybody please watch this movie. It's on Netflix. It's absolutely incredible. What's really interesting is actually the initial people who started this movement are from Venice, where I'm from. Um, but so Kiss the Ground uh, is an organization that um, 
does kind of everything, but really um, what the documentary will help you understand is it helps communicate regenerative farming on a larger scale, um, which is why I say we need to take the carbon from the sky and put it in the soil. So like the old paradigm argument in the perfume world was it was so much safer to use these like you know, synthetic things that lasted for 2000 years because you didn't have to do all of that farming. And I guess what Kiss the Ground would say and what I would say is if we can move the farming practices to regenerative, we're healing the earth um, and we can heal economies if we start to talk about some of these labor practices. Um, but yes, Kiss, Kiss the Ground is really incredible. In fact, um, you know, they talk, uh, they even talk about, um, you know, grazing, getting, you know, getting more grazing going, um, you know, even in like the middle of the United States, there are a lot of really amazing solutions. So in a world where we often feel like, oh my God, global warming, I feel so hopeless. This gives hope. Um, you know, I always think, and I, you know, I have my little plants outside, which is, you know, my green thumb really is uh, limited and I, I do try, but I always think, you know, you want earth with a plant in it. You don't want bare earth and you don't want cement. Every time you have a plant out there, um, you know, you're, you're taking in that carbon. And then also um, the quality of soil, the last thing I would say is significant. So it's not just, um, you know, if you treat the soil poorly, you can water it and water it and water it and it'll always be thirsty. You know, healthy soil uh, means that you're not watering things um, as much. And so that's why regenerative has to really be the way that we address these things and go forward because the old shift paradigm that we just don't deal with that we're farming badly and we build a bunch of factories to make the fake stuff, I think for the long term may not be the answer. Not that there's anything wrong there, but again, there are some people that make things with synthetics that I mean, like weep at the beauty of the art. So it's no disrespect to that, but environmentally speaking, um, our solutions simply aren't in building more factories. It's about what we do with the earth itself. But yes, here's the ground, watch that. Okay. I have yeah. a question, this has been wonderful. And Rachel, I can understand why you say just the stress, because you are working in two industries or fields, the wine and perfumery, which both have colonization, I guess, oh. cultures. <laughs> oh I, my wanted God. To, I wanted to ask you, as you are working in both of these fields, how would you say the wine industry, is it more evolved and moving towards decolonization? And is there any things you can learn uh, from well, perfumery? Uh, well, you know, the court of master sommeliers, um, which, you know, I remember the day I got my pin, I was so excited. But the Court of Master Sommeliers is a very sexist, you know, organization. And so they just had a big explosion and they've been, they've redone their board and taken over. This is a very, you know, you know, colonized sort of portion of the wine industry. And yet you, you really in the wine industry also have these winemakers who, um, have been a total inspiration to me who are like, if you don't have good soil and you don't have good farming practices, you don't have good fruit. Like that's how you make the beauty is out of the land. Um, and I believe that to be true. And it's just something I haven't heard discussed in the perfume world. And so in the wine world, like there's been acknowledgement, like there's a lot of, uh, it's a man's club, you know, it's definitely, and there's an acknowledgement of that. But I would say with the perfume world, um, the level of just blatant appropriation uh, or uh, marginalizing uh, other non-Eurocentric cultures has been um, very shocking to experience. But then again, my dad did teach um, colonialism in Africa. And like, you know what I mean? Like I did grow up having these, these conversations, you know, so, you know, but so it was very, but it was still, um, perfume more than anything, it was a very sort of shocking thing. But I think what wine has to teach again is, you know, the extraction process matters. How it's picked matters. All of that stuff matter like, um, and can make an extraordinary difference, you know? Um, and to me, that's magic of it. Yeah, I think, I think what's interesting is, um, the associations for chocolate, for wine, there are 
third party organizations that certify whether it's, you know, you see these icons on, on food products, fair trade, fair labor practices, sustainability. And in perfume, part of that has been that the industry has been very closed, right? It's very Eurocentric and a lot of you know, a lot of people who want to make perfume don't know how to make perfume because the industry has been closed. And what's interesting is in this process in the last few years, of course, consumers want clean beauty. Now it, it has become kind of a tipping point. People also want clean perfume. There's a lot of miscommunication, misleading, lots of marketers who, who use these words thrown around and they're the, right now we're experiencing in real life in real time right now as it's happening things are getting shaken up right because there's a lot of conversation between sustainable perfumery natural perfumery synthetic perfumery what's better isn't it better to to source synthetically sandalwood rather than chop down young trees when they haven't grown old yet. You know, there's so many things well, that we, we don't know the answers to. We don't know the answers to, but one thing I'd like to say about that is, how about you guys? We can use other things that aren't just sandalwood sometimes. Right. So right. I think that's part of the answer is sometimes you leave special ingredients for special things. Right. Also, that's part of the answer. No, there probably won't be an agreement anytime soon because of the natural uh, versus, um, European organization um, disagreement, but I will put it from a colonial, like in my opinion, uh, the part, portion of this that is colonial to me is that it is a colonial worldview to take something and go, this is only this molecule, 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 not molecule. That's all that it, this is. I've now taken this molecule away from a flower. So it's no longer in the thing that you're gonna be experiencing it. Um, in fact, I'm not even taking that molecule. I'm taking a synthetic version of that molecule and I'm testing that and I'm deciding that that's dangerous, but I haven't tested what the whole thing does. Mm -hmm. Like, like we, aren't, we aren't gonna bother to do tests on what the whole ingredient does. And we aren't gonna mention how it was extracted, which also matters by the way, in terms of skin sensitivity. Um, so if this isolationist view I can't, I could never have a conversation about allergies or safety or anything else, um, simply because if you create a construct where only one argument can win, you've created a construct, but scientifically um, that is a limited way of looking. I spoke to a biologist about this last week, lab chemistry and organic chemistry are different things. And an ingredient a whole ingredient, and this has been discussed a lot in the perfume, not the perfume, in the food world, right? There's a lot of science around how whole ingredients function differently. Mm -hmm. So if you take uh, a, an heirloom wheat and you bake a bread with it, and you have people that are sensitive to wheat, the heirloom wheat that was a whole wheat, not processed, made, you know, like a whole foods type of bread isn't giving the same allergic reaction as say a white bread. And so this does function um, within perfumery, but it's also, again, um, it is a somewhat colonial view to look at things in an isolationist versus a whole, a whole food, a whole plant or whole body um, manner. And so um, all, all, you know, it's just that the, whole viewpoint should be as valid as the other viewpoint. And um, I hope in the future when people discuss it, um, we can all be kinder to each other because this conversation makes people a little wacky. And I think if we're gonna move forward in this, you know, we have to have conversations without it becoming about that organization. Um, you know, and people just get very heated um, because I support whole natural ingredients. It doesn't mean that I don't love science. I absolutely love science. My perfume is made in microbiology, you know? I mean, I do a whole weird, crazy thing and I couldn't do that if I didn't love science. So there's just, like I said, there's just so many different ways um, for people to make perfume, but also this conversation cannot, you know, if we're going to further a conversation on safety and natural beauty, we're gonna have to step away from only looking at the world through the paradigm of isolates, isolationism and lab chemistry, which is fundamentally from a scientific perspective different than organic chemistry. Well, and also I think then it, it begs the question, well, 
why do we have to have a formula that feeds the desire for millions of people? Why don't we take the concept of fast fashion and slow food and have slow perfumery? I love what you're saying that you're taking plant intelligence and, and the vibration of the soil to create something wholesome, not in a non-sexual way, but the, but the integral way the, the it, you know, having integrity instead of, you know, taking it away and, and just taking an isolate and removing it because that's the only way you're going to get the same fragrance over and over again is when you have made it kind of a robot versus when you look at biodynamic wine, you, you, it's dated, that batch is going to taste different and it's okay. And in fact, it's awesome to have fragrances in the future that that is just this fragrance is made the way it is because I know the farmer, I know the best practices. It was distilled. Like I have, I have materials that I brought back from Turkey, this Turkish rose. I made a limited edition winter rose and that, that's it, basta, because that rose that I brought back was harvested that year, that particular vintage of rose, there was a drought that year, so it was super limited. And you know what, it's ephemeral, that, that's it. I made limited edition 200 bottles. I carried the Turkish rose in my luggage and that's it. And that's, that's not only got to be okay, but that's also part of the conversation we have to have because why don't we have more slow perfume? Because not only, not only is it beautiful to know who the perfumer is and that person's artistry, but the artistry of the farmer and the artistry of the distiller, which are two different processes, right? I mean, I've been to the mountains in Oaxaca and visit, visited with mescaleros. And when you oh. see the fermentation is different, you see that the agave is grown in these beautiful high altitude mountains. This one has hibiscus growing in the garden. This one has honeysuckle and crazy chickens running around. And so <laughs> he makes the pachuga, it's smoked differently. Oh, and yeah. His piñas, his agave, when he smashes it, he, this one uses a horse and a stone mill and this other one uses a bat. And so not only were the growing of the plants different, the distillation, the fermentation was different. It's, it's just like artistry upon artistry upon artistry. And I think if we start to be more transparent about the perfume, the, the plant materials, how it's grown, how it's processed, and just be transparent with the information and people can learn to say, oh my God, you have this connection, right? Like, like um, Jack Chapman, you know, he only distills in glass, right? So when you smell his materials, his fucking co-distillation with frankincense and jasmine is unbelievable because he knows with the jasmine grower, he knows the frankincense and he's co-distilled it in glass because he wants to capture the high, tiny little molecules that are very volatile that you're not going to get in any other, you know, um, steel contraption that, no. that processes five tons at a time. And, no, I and I've seen people weep when they've smelled Jack Chapman's. Uh oh, yeah. it's he's he's like truly an artist. And I think also procurement, right? So we can talk about John Steele, who, you know, mm -hmm. he, he's like his alligator juniper. I don't even know where he gets it from. And when you smell it, you're just like, your, your brain, mm -hmm. it's like beyond umami. Your brain just literally gets reprogrammed because when you smell something that has that level of um, really high vibration, mm -hmm. it, changes, it changes you in that moment cellularly and it also, because you're breathing in that essence from the plant, right? And so when you breathe that in, you're having that conversation with you, your spirit and the plant spirit. But people, mm -hmm. people especially, let's say, who are learning things in, um, in the French schools, let's just say, you're not learning this stuff. Um, I mentioned um, Jack Chapman, I'll, I'll drop his name down, and also John Steele. Um, they're both gurus in the natural world, I would say, and um, they're both in um, Los Angeles, and they do have ties to, not Jack, but John does, ties to um, the Institute for Art and Olfaction. He teaches sometimes. Perfumer's Apprentice does sell some of John Steele's materials. His company I'm not sure if they do anymore. Oh, okay. They just, okay. Um, but you aromatics. can Google him. Yeah, aromatics. Um, yeah, like 
Right. So I want to open. It's it's already four. I can't even believe we could talk for hours. I'm going to drop the names down in the in the chat room, and then I'm going to open it up to um, the audience for some questions. If anyone wants to ask questions. And um, wow, Rachel, we could talk for ages and ages. Oh, I know. I just you just made me pull out my blue lotus emanation. But, oh, and yeah. Blue Lotus, what a, what, a, what a tragedy that they closed. I mean, like when he said- Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no. I, I, I mean- uh, White. Oh, oh, yes. The actual Jack material. Shaver. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, yes. No, that's, that's- Oh, my God. Yes. Such a yeah. tragedy. I agree. White Lotus or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. White Lotus. Christopher and his w lovely wife had this incredible company who procured incredible materials from India. I mean, I have materials that now are like vintage and I don't even open them because I don't want to wreck them with the oxygen. So I just look at lovingly the bottles oh <laughs> and I just remember how it smelled. But, you know, like, uh, you know, I'd be like seriously vintage things that like, you know, just like, you know, I, I used to have these um, host these perfumers breakfasts and we used to bring our precious, like literally ah, precious. I'd be like, here, smell this thing. Oh my God. You know, you're just freaking out. Okay. So John, steel aromatics okay anyone else with questions um hey can um, we just ask questions yeah yeah please do hey what's up everyone um i'm ezra it's the it's in the i'm in the uk right now so it's like 10 past midnight so forgive me if i'm a little faded um but i uh yeah thank you so much for that rachel really appreciate it um i think i just wanted to um like you know ask, I guess, and give my two pence. Um, but yeah, I think I, I've been working in industry for like three years and uh, conversation definitely holds its place. Um, wider than like fragrance, I think last year was a real uh, movement, not a moment as it's been described as. And I think it's a really important we take that on. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also becoming more and more aware of the importance of coalition over allyship. Um, and I'm quoting, but allyship can often infer the antonym of that being a victim that you engage with via charity. Um, and I think it's super key that we stay aware of that being in the West as well, um, mm. as well as other privileges. But yeah, I kind of just wanted to ask you in terms of, um, yeah, supply chains and raw material sourcing, obviously conversations and um, acknowledgement has its place in the beginning, but obviously it's about action. Um, mm. it, what it comes down to and that action falls really and truly on the bigger players in the wider industry um, and i'm talking the multi-billion dollar conglomerates that have a neo-colonial hold over certain places and peoples so i was wondering what is your opinion um, on how we can think of begin to think of common goals um, rather than charity-led action um, that can genuinely change that on a grander scale for the people who are farming said raw materials? I mean, I think of this every day. Um, I wake up in the night because I think sourcing is a real problem because it is owned by these large companies. What I've chosen to do is never purchase from them and never purchase from anyone who purchases from them um, simply because I want no part of any, any of that, um, but not everybody has that option. Um, so, I mean, really other than me encouraging people to start maybe finding ways of even extracting your own things, I am at a, I like literally, I'm up at three in the morning, four in the morning going, how are we going to shift this industry that is so owned by like, just a few, it seems a few different people um, that is sort of doing it, you know, is, ex is exploitive. They're not, they're not transparent. I mean, yeah, you're right. We do have to do more than speak up and call them um, on the phone or write letters. Um, you know, a campaign toward that that's a little more organized uh, as a coalition might be good. But yes, as you're saying, you know, perhaps there's a way that we can create an actual coalition to discuss these things more deeply and actually fight it in a much more tangible way than just like acknowledging the elephant in the room. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm down for that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, that's I mean, no, I love, um, leave, make sure you leave your information, you know, or I guess Yosh will have all of your information. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I would love- I, I, was, I was invited uh, via Pia Long um, uh, from All Fiction to this. 
Um, yeah, but yeah, so good. like I feel yeah, I fully agree. Um, but yeah, that's 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 kind of what um I think is important to again realize is like we're while we at, on our kind of level and scale have one um I guess more social impact. I think that the true uh beyond financial is about like real capital that impact comes from like levels up so it's kind of like again what are some common goals that we can that can be discussed um and we can work towards building um because it yeah again it, this chain this as you as i'm sure you've come across these incredibly fragile um some of these incredibly and fragile uh, supply methods aren't by accident um they're very much intentional to keep someone on a string. Like, you know, if if they decide to leave this client, this client decides to, decides to leave, that's multiple thousands of farmers' livelihoods gone. That's, it's intentional why that is so precious and so fragile. Um, so we can't approach it with the bull and, you know, the glass shop mentality. It, sure. Again, it wasn't built overnight, so we can't disseminate it overnight. And I also think in general, um, decolonization is a, process and method countering neo-colonialism so it's like yeah I think I, I fully agree with you um but I'm just super excited to hear um what are some tangible things we can start to talk about like common goals um I think that's super key to have in the back of our minds at this point too because well, acknowledging maybe you just yeah, formed like, a coalition maybe you just formed an organization right here on this call that <laughs> you know right, maybe we on. should I'm very serious maybe we should get a group of us together to maybe discuss this more deeply to see if there are more common sense ways that we can start impacting this. Yeah, I mean, there are people out there Like I, I joined a seminar earlier this year called the Global Frankincense Alliance. And um, that was super important um, and uh, moving as well on a more personal level, because it's like I could really see the diaspora connecting from the continent outwards and it was beautiful. Um, but also to have to hear people on the ground um, talk about their experience and their reality was so key. Um, and I was also very conscious of the European people's um, coming in with their opinion, trying to overshadow shit, not realizing their, you know, privilege and how they were talking and all this stuff. You're why, bro, how are you talking about barcodes in rural Somalia? Like, what are you, or what are you talking about? So it's like, um, yeah, it's like, again, I think these are, we have to look at this as a global thing because it is a global thing and always has been. Um, so yes, hearing from the ground is mad key. But that, yeah, the people are out, like people are interested, like people, you know, this is a bigger conversation. So yeah, um, I think it's I, I, that time. Um, I, wanna, I wanna put two of you together. So Ezra and Carla, both of you are in London. I don't know if you two know each other, but Carla is a journalist working in this field. And Ezra, um, I am- hey, so I'm not in London anymore. I'm from oh. South originally. Oh, That's sorry, part, okay. okay. Sorry about that. But I, I wanted to also just mention, Ezra is a new member of Full Fiction who um, Pia Long has, it, it works closely with the British Society of Perfumers and they were one of the first to publicly denounce Oriental as a category and, and, and urge all its members to use Amber instead. And I think having that as a public statement is huge. And then also I wanted to mention that um, I think what you're saying is, is there's a couple of things. There's people here in the audience who are consumers um, and they may feel like they're, they're a fly on the wall because a lot of us are also industry and there's also niche industry and then corporate. And I think that's where we have to find kind of this intersection. Of course, our theme is intersectionality and perfumery is how do we, how do we tie or how can we find the thread for the the supply chain, the farmers, because the for some consumers, if they shop at Sephora, Ulta, you know, Harrods, or some of these, you know, big box retailers, they might not even understand the conversation of free trade anything. They might understand it if they go to Starbucks. But right now, I can tell you in the very limited time I've been doing this, to tell the story to a consumer is very different than talking shorthand to another perfumer who's independent. And then sometimes when I talk to corporate, 
it, it's like they only talk in like dollar signs. So I don't even matter to a lot of people because my business is small or the, the kind of pressure I can push on people is small because I, you know, whatever don't matter because, because they only view things in a dollar manner, right? Well, how many pounds is your minimum order quantity? And, and so when you, when you talk those, that, that it's like, well, how do I translate this conversation effectively and impactfully so that the consumer knows what's going on because they may not know that frankincense is on the red list they may not know that the farmer who's going around collecting the tears doesn't get paid at all, or that it's ruining the ground, or that, you know, there is the sandalwood. We, of course, there's no Indian sandalwood. We can use New Caledonia sandalwood or, or you know, but, but to a consumer, they've only, they've never smelled Indian sandalwood. They've never, don't even know the difference between Hawaiian sandalwood and New Caledonian sandalwood. Like, how do we, how do we organize ourselves um, beyond a, a Zoom call with you at midnight and Tammy at 10 yeah. in the morning. Oh, go ahead. Christine has something raised. Go ahead, Christine. This is, so, this is so awesome. Thank you all for staying a little bit longer. Christine, would you like to say something? Hi, sorry. I'm going to keep my camera off because my signal is so weak and I don't want to lose sure. the conversation. But um, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to Yosh for organizing this festival once again. And then thank you to Rachel for this really wonderful presentation. And also thank you to the audience because I think the chat and these questions, um, Ezra's question I think is really, really key about the, the sort of neo-colonial hold. And I'm reminded, I come from academia. So mm -hmm. um, Yosh and I have had some exchange on Instagram in the chat. <laughs> um, so, I'm thinking about the sort of de, uh, the decolonial movement in indigenous Native America. So if we think about um, where that movement originated, it came from a land back movement and the land was actually central to the idea of decolonization. And there's a wonderful article um, by uh, Tuck and Yang, which is cited often in academic study about decolonization is not a metaphor so that we have to really think about how we're using this terminology and how we're applying it because everybody thinks about it differently just as everybody thinks about fair trade differently and that for indigenous native americans and indigenous uh, scholars in the united states specifically that the the term decolonization is a return of the land to the people who had it and had it taken from them so i think that this idea that rachel's been bringing up all along and and this conversation about sort of the neo-colonial holds we're talking about the land. So how do we give the land back to the people in, in different parts of the globe? And I think that the example that Rachel cited early was um, you know, Diaspora Co. I think they're doing a really great job of empowering farmers on the ground locally and paying them more than a fair wage. But then how do you amplify that without becoming, again, a sort of capitalist corporation? I don't know. I'm a big fan of just, well, I'm a big well, fan of that company as well. But I'm, I'm a huge fan, but you know, I stumbled across something that really triggered my mind and it was the Dr. Bronner soap company guys. And they retooled so that they, they're in charge of all of their own sourcing so that they could look about look at these kinds of things um but yeah they're not doing what diaspora you know is doing which is much more powerful um which is wait there's a really complicated way of saying um some of the land does have to go back i mean there are ways in which the land legitimately can go back you know turtle island was returned i believe of course tahiti should be returned um, there are ways in which we can also acknowledge uh, sovereignty of nations, you know, indigenous nations within the United States. I'm not saying we all move out of our homes. I think people move panicky when they hear that. But yes, I think the land back movement is a really important part of that. And we've also proven ourselves to not be worthy as a uh, shepherds of the land. And so, you know, that is also part of this larger conversation to shifting how we handle it back to um, its original caregivers, which we're doing a much better job. Yeah, the second, I, I completely agree. And um, the, second, the second sort of shorter point is that um, I think especially in the history of perfumery, um, you know, we, we have tons of books on the history of perfumery, but 
in those volumes, um, you know, this is the project of my dissertation. I'm working on the history of perfumery in 17th and 18th century um, Britain, which is not really like a history that we think about as being, you know, one of perfumery, but it's really entangled with this idea of colonialism. And without colonialism, without trade, without the sort of networks that existed for centuries in the Mediterranean, moving materials from, you know, East Asia, North Africa, et cetera, you know, circumnavigating the globe, we wouldn't have perfumery in Europe at all, right? <laughs> so, or in Britain especially. But my point is that in those histories, the materials have been divorced from um, colonialism. And I think it's really time to, you know, through these seminars to really entangle them. Because like Yosh, um, Yosh has said, when people are taught the history of perfumery and fragrance school, you know, if they're even lucky to get into a fragrance school, like just starting my project, nobody returned my emails from fragrance companies. You know, I emailed many, many people and nobody returned my emails. And, and I just had to do the work myself and try to find people and find people that would help me. And, you know, and that was the really frustrating thing that this colonial system, this neo-colonial system, this, um, possession of knowledge that is not inherently your own is 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 um, is so. I mean, I guess it's just gatekeeping, right? And you know, anybody that wants to ask those questions is sort of um, sidelined in a way. So I guess it's less of a question, but more of a more of a just um, a comment that you know we have to tell these stories together. We have to talk about the raw materials not just in the sense of fair trade now, but also through, you know, involving academics, involving other people like, uh, you know, um, economic botanists who are working on these things for centuries and also oral histories of, of the land because um, that's really important because those aren't part of often colonial documents. So I don't know, anyway, oh, no, I'm talking I mean, absolutely, too long, but the, the, the points that are coming to my head. No, no, absolutely. No, I was just gonna, uh high five you on the oral histories not being documented in the right way front and of course everything um, else you just said. Yeah, no, I think that we 600% thank you to everything and I absolutely agree. Um, and, you know, I'm okay. I, the only thing I'd say is I'm okay with them being gatekeepers to the way that they're teaching perfume in, in uh, France right now, because I think that there are a million other ways to make perfume. And if I were to have studied there, I wouldn't have figured out how to make the smell of fruit from fruit. Mm. Because I would have just been taught to do it this one way. Um, and so right. I hope that people holding and being gatekeepers allows people to think a little more out of the box and get a little crazy and a little creative. Um, and maybe they'll make something that doesn't smell like something 20 other perfumers have made. Um, but I really love what you're saying about getting um, academics involved and also um, what you were saying about uh, not ethnobotany, but can you go back to that? I don't mean to, anyway. Oh, uh, an economic botanist. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because often they're doing these sort of ethnographies and they're often on the ground, um, you know, and there is, you have to be careful because in all of these things, like I'm Western, I have to mm -hmm. situate my own perspective and my own, um, you know, state clearly my own positionality in this, where I come from and what I've learned. Um, but I think that it's, you know, this is part of the work that if we all start doing a little bit of it, we can all help each other because no one person you know, can have all of this, like, you know, it's just like a supply chain. There's people that do each part. Um, you know, there's people that do the harvesting, there's people who do the growing. And, and I think knowledge works in the same way that there's a network of people that it takes to get solutions to these problems. Mm. Um, 600%, yeah. I want to open up, Carla, do you have a comment to make before I close up? Um, I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I wasn't, I backtracked a little bit, but uh, just, I think having also worked on like, not just writing about scent, but having also worked on the retail side of it, I think that, yeah, mm -hmm. also just the fact that so many, you know, or, or a lot of consumers don't even know about, you know, the difference between raw materials, let alone where they come from. And I feel like there's been this, like, mm -hmm. and obviously I can only say it from my perspective, but like this idea of like, 
this romanticized Eurocentric viewpoint on which like fragrance has been sold on for so many for so many decades and how kind of almost like needing to sort of shatter that illusion because you think oh these you know all the all that's published are like the beautiful pictures of the fields and grass or whatever and you don't get the whole picture of you know whether it's whether it's like the the unsustainable farming methods or the fact that people are being exploited and stuff so I feel like it's yeah, with the coalition and 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 just excited to see where this goes because I feel like this is really stuff that's for the purpose of selling product that that's not exposed, but it really really needs to be. So yeah, just just glad to be here. Thanks everyone for all the insight. Thank you, no, for coming. But yeah, nobody sold a bottle of perfume with with going. This is the factory runoff. By the way, these molecules last for two thousand years and will live longer than your descendants. You know. Um, but hopefully, hopefully some reality can seep in, um, you know, over time. No, I, 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 I'm sorry, that always cracks me up, sorry. I've got something else I wanna say um, real quick. Carla, thank you, and everyone speaking, really appreciate being here as well. Um, like, you know, it goes about saying, there's still so much that I'm like yet to learn. Um, you're all right, like that is where we're at. We're still at a place where people are talking about, oh, chemicals are evil. And it's like, we're all chemicals, don't you know what you're talking about. Like we're still- at a No, place not where, all chemicals are evil. I certainly don't, but go on. No, I'm saying that's what people, yeah. that's where we're at. That's where consumers yeah. are at. Most people who say this is made of chemicals, they will be like, oh my God, get that away from me. That's that's where we're at. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we're, we're lucky enough to be educated differently, but like, again, it's like, we're, this is the environment we're in. Um, and we have to, that's the kind of point um, that was that I was hearing when you were saying, you know, it's like, how do we this, can, get consumers to believe that and we'll get consumers not to believe it, but to understand it. That's the point. That's the challenge. That's like the design challenge is like, we have to make it simple as building blocks for kids, for people just to be like, oh, this and this is this. Oh, right. Okay, fine. That's simple. That's the whole point. And I think how we go about any form of real coalition with mm -hmm from farmer to consumer, it's we actually have to stand, understand our place and know when to shut the hell up and listen to people on the ground first mm. and understand, listen to what they need rather than us coming in and being like, oh, how can we put our heads together and think about what is best for these people? Be like, nah, let's actually mm. listen to what the women in Somalia need when they're sorting frankincense out and listen to how they're getting played by middlemen who come in and you know ru ruin their economic uh, like you know economic like sovereignty or whatever like mm. let's listen to that first and then we can build the common goals like you know again the conversation we're having here is super key and like what just touching what you said Carla as well yes it's a luxury but also it's, it's incredibly domestic like fabric conditioner like laundry detergent washing up liquid on the surface, they're miles apart, but in reality, they're all coming from the same place. Mm -hmm. So it's, that, it's addressing that, which is gonna do any significant change. Like it's, it's so yeah, it, it does have its place in, in beauty and luxury, but it's also been around every part of our lives, all of our fucking days we've lived. So it's like, yeah, I think when we're talking about real, um, real progression, we have to understand our, place in it and it's not necessarily the that we're not necessarily the ones who will be the the first ideas considering what people need yeah we might need to shut up for a second and listen and then like figure out what we can do um and as i said i'm still learning so much i'm learning so much from this there's so much i'm yet to learn um but this is this is it i think yeah we have to recognize that it's really important 600 percent 600%. Okay, so we have a question or a comment from Joy, Joycelyn and Jocelyn, and then um, I'm afraid we're, we're like, this. We, we won, we have to obviously continue this conversation. So I wanna hear from Jocelyn and then figure out, um, like we must bookmark or, or earmark an, another time to have this kind of quarterly meeting of the heads or something. Okay, Jocelyn, do you have a comment or you, you had a question about something for life? I did, I did. Is this, can you hear me though? Yeah. Yeah, cool. I was just, um, so uh, apologies. I had a bit of a brain, I, I don't know, but I, I meant to be here at eight, but it was nine. 
So I was geared up, ready for nine o'clock and realised I've, I've missed it. So I'm hoping that um, I can get a recorded copy. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I wanted to ask about for life certification. So companies like LMR, which is owned by IFF, have uh, for life certification in a lot of their raw materials or they're working towards it with EcoCert status as well. So I was wondering about your opinion about that because you were talking about you know, these large conglomerates. So they're looking at vertical integration platforms. They're looking at ensuring the farmers are being paid well, reducing child labor, um, you know, improving soil conditions and, and offering support that is more, so instead of just paying to, you know, a head or we'll make this order, there's this guarantee of a fair price being paid regardless of what's happening in the market. You know, so think, oh, sorry, but I, like, yeah. This is part of the conversation that really needs to happen because some guy in a suit is basically dictating what he thinks the farmer is making, should make. And this yeah. is what Ezra is saying is we need to ask the farmer because the other part of that equation is, uh, this is where I get really livid, is people in that room traditionally are white males. And a white male, as we know, is not going to take care of anyone outside of his domain. So this is the problem, is that there's not enough diversity at those decision-making tables. We have to definitely be there at the table because, as we know, most women are communally minded. And so unless... There are people who, you know, not just me, but like, unless we have diversity at the table and we have different kinds of conversations, I love what Ezra has brought up is what do the farmers need? Not what do, what does a guy, what does a white guy think that the farmer needs? Because for example, right now, you know, when I, when, when I saw the image of the, of the Haitian refugee being whipped on the horse, my mind also went to, my God, you know, selfishly, oh my God, my, my Haitian vetiver is now yeah. even more rare. That, that's like my mind did have that thought. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But it's like, well, we, of course we have to have that conversation because if, if they're not even able to sustain themselves on a, on a decent human level, how can we be buying products made from vetiver and how can we continue to glorify vetiver when we're not even aware of what's happening? You know, like, 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 so unless we have these types, I and mean, people love to say perfumes, not political, and that just drives <laughs> completely <laughs> nuts. And so, so consumers don't even realize what the fuck is happening. Not all consumers, but we have to like wake people up to the complete, um, necessary upheaval of, of what's going on in those boardrooms because the, this vertical integration is yeah. in some ways, um, what's the word, not really helping the farmers. They're just buying everything up so that they can control everything. And so we want, sometimes we look at that and we go, oh, that's fine. Uh, IFF bought everything in Madagascar and they say that they're, they're, they're doing whatever, whatever. Well, we have to ask questions like that. The, you're telling me that the largest supply or a flip flavor and fragrance, you mean to tell me that they bought everything in Madagascar, but why are they still so poor then? And, and what the fuck happened last year? So if they're taking I'm care of this, yo, in I mean, Madagascar, well, like how, how is this possible? And I mean, also, one thing that I'm thinking of the about is that I, you know, this might just be my idealistic viewpoint, but how is there a way to get direct relationships with these farmers? Right. I'm right. not necessarily, you know, I'm loving this discussion and I would love to be a part of this coalition. My viewpoint is not necessarily trying to get at the table with the big companies. Hmm. Is there a way that we as a coalition and other indies and niche can start building our own buy so that in a way we're operating that we can make large buys 
uh, directly to these farmers because I, I try to think about it from other industries. You know, I think about the, the record music industry. Many artists got upset with how the big record companies were streaming and not being paid fairly for the streams. And so they are separating out and making their own way in terms of digital streaming and music. So is there a way we can operate from an independent way directly with farmers? I, I'm gonna interject and say I'm in the, I mean, early stages. Uh, this has always been my long-term goal is to go further on that, especially since I also uh, do hydro distillations and things, but this is always, before I became a perfumer, what you're saying um, was actually a larger goal uh, to me. And so early stages, but I've been talking with a few people, especially since that um, there was also that other uh, essential oil company, um, Eden got bought off, bought out recently. And so I was just like, oh, and uh -huh. so I've been making phone calls and touching with different people about creating awesome. something around this where we can be a little, um, feel a little better about our purchasing and um, the, you know, back to, and ask people what that money is. You know, you said, does anybody, I talked to a, a vanilla farmer this week, you know, like the asking of course is the first way to go is what is needed. But, um, but some, but you know, some of these farmers, you know, you, you know, I mean, in Tahiti, I guess it's like, I, you know, send emails or whatever, but um, you'd be surprised at sometimes the materials I've gotten by reaching out to people through, you know, through, through the internet around the world and getting my sister to translate into another language. And um, so we can actually try to contact farmers, you know, like sometimes there really is an internet. So when that's the case, we can do that. But again, my, my long-term dream is to find a way to solve some of this um, larger issue. Wow, okay. As a community, you know, as a community article and not as a yeah. Go ahead. I'm just thinking about what you've been saying about the transparency process. So obviously this is this is something that was a movement in the cosmetic industry and, and Lush was instrumental in that kind of um, education as well. I worked for Lush for, I don't know how many years <laughs> in my early twenties, but um, I think, you know, one of these questions when we're just, just back on this for life or say people are saying, oh, we're doing good things. I suppose the question that we ask is what, in what way did you decide the good things? Was it part of the consultation process? Mm -hmm. So if we was to sit at the table with, with LMR, for an example, you know, because we were talking about this, how did you decide that this was the best thing? Or how in the for life certification, because it is a separate certification, in what way does that decision to provide that, do, is it, is it a consultation process with the farmers? Is it a consultation process with the growers? So the growers say, for us to say, this is what we need. And for life says, okay, well, we'll make this part of our priority. So it's like, I suppose what we wanna know is, is how is the decision-making process made? So, you know, rather than this is what we think you need, like we had this in a, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, Australia has, a, it, Horrific, horrifying history of, of colonialism and, and abuse you know so rather than saying this is what we feel you need so giving blankets mm -hmm. to the original or indigenous mm -hmm. people um it was more you know the question is what do you need and and That's again like, returning that sovereignty um and it, it's it was just a shout out actually because I, I noticed you mentioned it as well uh, you know the dutch and custodians have this a fantastic uh sandalwood company which i purchased from in they're in Western Australia and it's an indigenous lead. And they've just recently won uh, the UN Equator Prize for sustainability and indigenous leadership. I mean, this is, supporting them is about supporting, number one, my country. I don't use other sandalwoods because I wanna support what's indigenous my, to my country. Um, but yeah, asking, let's, it's that part of this coalition. You know, let's put some questions and say, how does your consultation process work? Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a way that we can then, what do you think? I'm putting it out to the forum. 
the Dot Jan Sandwa company is yeah. such an amazing model because it's like there's no excuse in 2020 that like from from this that no one 2021 that sh people shouldn't be following a system like that or working towards working like that model that there's no excuse for it and I, I think it's like people like again that's that's the behind the scenes stuff where you have common shit you have shares given to the farmers and growers exports they have that shares that's locked in and that's what's so important but again i don't think i don't think it's a mistake that it's not like that um i think it's like what you're saying it's the difference between allyship and coalition um is the way i'm beginning to see it now is that allyship you're doing it through charity if you're giving a bunch of farmers goats and you think that's a long-term commitment to their lifestyle and their sustainability you're deluded so it's like, no, the coalition is about talking to, we, the point is we don't know that yet because we haven't spoken because that, they will let us know what they need and what they want. And what we can do is build on how we can like, you know, share that responsibility from where we're at. And again, I think when a real, real change happens in situations like the Dutch and light situation, when like actual shares are dedicated and then it's up to the, the you know the indigenous community to want to give another fifteen percent of their thing to community to community projects. Like that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, but yeah, I think it goes without saying. Uh, maybe it doesn't. It's important actually to say that like at this stage we don't we keep it private and we keep it as in private to you know like a smaller number of people. However, mm -hmm. we don't alert high, higher powers because it's easy for them to corrupt that idea. Um, but I think, yeah, uh, again, um, I think the point is we don't, we might not know yet what that looks like because we have to listen at this stage. Maybe yeah. that's the way around. Um, and, that, and that's what Diaspora Spice Co. did as well. So, I mean, 600%, like, yes. That's, a start. Yeah. that's someone to talk to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and definitely depending on, like, I called a few van uh, vanilla farmers that, that, you know, my French is not fantastic, but had some conversations over the last week. And there's, you know, of course, like, you know, differing perspectives about things. And, um, but yeah, we definitely need to ask the, com the question instead of going in and assuming. Um, but I would love it if we all exchanged information and maybe scheduled something to talk more on this. And the, the other thing I would say is that I would love to encourage like new generations of perfumers to consider other ingredients sometimes that aren't always as precious. You know, I, I took wood from a wood pile and made perfume that was gonna go into a fire. Like we can do these things, you know, like there are ways to like re rethink and reconsider even some of the materials that are like around us in our environment. Um, you know, which is kind of cool and amazing. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I think I have everyone's emails through Eventbrite, but you can also drop your contact details. And then um, there's three little dots on the right-hand side that, that you can save chat. So if everyone wants to um, just quickly do that, then um, we have a, then you have it at the ready. And then um, I do like the idea of meeting again. And um, is it possible to meet before the end of the year or should we shoot for the beginning of the year? Because it might give us time to reach out to other people. Um, we have, um, for oh, I can't hear you, Rachel. Um, Oh, I was going to say, even if only a few of us were available at the end of the year, um, it's, yeah. still, it's still a productive conversation to have. And it's certainly better than me talking about it inside my closet, like screaming my face off. And I've really been inspired by these questions and the insight on this. So I say by the end of the year. Okay, let's do that. Um, I'm happy to help organize that. And um, we can be judicious with who we want to invite into that conversation because I think you're right it's you know sometimes these things just take a minute to huddle and that's really kind of the intention of scent festival uh, I you know last year I had over 60 events and this year especially for this topic I just wanted to keep it 
intimate. And then of course, cause I'm an overachiever. I was like, Oh my God, I don't have a lot of ticket sales, but then I realized it's really not just more than okay, but you know, these, these types of conversations that are sensitive, there's, they're still incubating. And so I really want to say thank you to each of you who came. Um, I know this, these topics are not easy to discuss, but I hear a lot of passion and I also hear a lot of optimism. And I also hear a lot of, um, what's the word? There's, there's action behind these words. So I feel very emboldened. I was a little bit um, really unsure about having the festival be so focused on such a fiery topic. But after yesterday's events, after today's events, I see that that's definitely what's needed. And you know, there's, there's a couple of more events coming up um, that, that you know, please come. And, and as you've already been um, here already, if, if, if you have the funds to buy another ticket, please do. If you don't, I'm happy to extend a, um, complimentary um, passcode to you. And also um, let's definitely stay in touch and definitely, you know, any ideas, um, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of by myself doing whatever I'm doing. And so um, if anyone wants to just like, you know, offer up, I'm, 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 I'm here and I love getting DMs. Um, but I love the idea of having one, um, another meeting before the end of the year, um, I think that's also nice way to end the year because, you know, I don't know, but, but I still feel rather isolated, even though I'm vaccinated, I'm not yes. out in public, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I love that we have had like five different time zones, more than five different time zones. <laughs> and um, so let's, so let's have a, not a holiday party, but a, but a kind of a holiday gathering um, to get together to, to have a more serious conversations, but also just to um, extend community because I think it's important since we can't be together, but we can be here virtually together. And, um, you know, in the old days, we used to send each other scented packages. So may maybe we could do that again somehow and get to know each other better. Um, and, 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 you know, I'll think about it, but, but I, I love seeing all your faces and truly, it's so great to see the diversity here because, you know, when I started in the early nineties, it was a different, very landscape. So I want to thank you for being here and thank you for being here for almost two hours. And um, please do reach out and um, please do visit Rachel and her website to learn more about her and come next week to Teresa's um, panel. Um, that's going to be awesome. And then I'm gonna have a fireside chat um, next week also. And, and that'll be more specific about what's happening with the petition. If you haven't signed it yet, please do. And just update. So thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for your energy. Thank you for just being part of this community. And um, I just well, feel really Thank you for doing this, Yosh. Yes, it was oh, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, you for organizing this and, and it and I just so much gratitude. It's so needed. Like, thank you. No, and thank you for firing us up. Your, your, your yeah. presentation was awesome. You know, so heartfelt and, and really just so many questions, more questions. So that's, that's just the sign of a great presentation is leaving us with more inquis, in, inquis, inquis, curiosity, more curiosity. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.